Hello and welcome to the Japan Archives, a podcast where we'll be delving into the histories and mythologies from Japan's long history. I'm your host, Thomas. And I'm your co-host, Heather. We'll also be reading a poem for you every week and giving a little history about the poet who wrote it. Ikimashou! Hey guys, welcome back to the Japan Archives, episode 37 of the Japan Archives. And like we said last week, we weren't sure if we were going to do Cherry Blossoms or an Ainu Tale, but my Cherry Blossom book is still not here. So we're going to go with the first of our Ainu stories. Now normally I start with a question for Heather. So let's go with what do you already know about the Ainu? That's a very good question. I knew this was coming and I, I had every opportunity to look this up, but I'm kind of starting from the perspective of I want to know more. The information I have is that they were indigenous Japanese people that or I believe it was a northern part of Japan and they have their own language and their own customs. And I, I've actually seen a ritual Oh gosh, it was on the new on a news broadcast. I've seen a ritual for I think it was like a harvesting or rice planting, perhaps. And that is the limit of my knowledge so far. Like I'm really looking forward to learning more about them, just because I know so so little. Hmm. I'm looking forward to learning more about them as well. I'm I think this podcast is definitely going to encourage me and you to learn more about it because for me as well, I don't know much about. I knew like when it comes to textbooks and things about them, there's a lot less. I mean, historically, they have kind of been ignored to some extent by the Japanese. And it was only in the past few decades that they were actually recognized as an indigenous people of Japan. Um, That's how long it took them to recognize them. Um, So they've had quite a lot of struggle. They were persecuted to some extent, like... They weren't allowed to be themselves. They weren't allowed to follow their religious practices and things. But like I said, now they have finally been recognized. But today is not really about the history of the Ainu itself. I just wanted to do one of their folk tales. And then obviously at a later date, we will definitely come back to them and delve a bit more into who they are, their traditions and things. Yeah, I think it's something that we'll have to like really take care of because there's a, a lot of history and a lot of things that we don't know and coming from outside of Japan. I think we have to like be really careful and just sensitive about the topic itself. So I think it's one that I really think we, when we do the research, it's going to take like a little bit more time just to make sure that we try to cover it in the best way that we can in the most respectful way that we can. Mm, definitely. So in regards to the story today, well, first of all, I want to tell you a bit about the woman who wrote the story down. Uh, she was known as Chiri Yukie, and she wrote one book during her life, and this was a collection of the traditional chants of Ainu folklore, and all of them were written down in the Ainu language. Now, the book itself was known as the Ainu Shinyo Shu. Her book, which was actually written in parallel Ainu and Japanese, um, it was actually the first book in in the Ainu language, but it was also the first book about the Ainu language, written from the point of an actual Ainu speaker. So until this point, like, at least historically, most books were actually written from the perspective of, like, Japanese people. Chidi was born in 1903, and by this point, like, the Ainu were pretty much now only in Hokkaido. But in 1903, this was when Hokkaido was finally starting to westernize. There was big drastic changes. And so again, the Ainu were greatly affected and a lot of their traditional customs, such as like their tattooing, as well as bear sacrifices, they were actually falling into decline. And unfortunately, as Japan was trying to quickly westernize, the Ainu again began to lessen in number. Going back specifically to Chiri, she was born into an aristocratic family, but actually one that was quite poor. And even though her father was chief of one of the Ainu tribes, for some 
reason or other, probably financially, she was actually raised by her aunt and her grandmother. She grew up around these women, and both of them were well-versed in the old oral traditions of the Ainu, and they knew a lot of the old stories of the Ainu. Eventually, one day, someone called Kindaichi Kyosuke came to visit her and her aunt and grandmother, and this person was actually a Japanese linguist. Basically, he came saying that he wanted to record the Ainu language and traditions, and so Chiri then decided to devote herself to recording the stories that both her aunt and grandmother knew to preserve all these old Ainu folk tales. That is what she did, and that is when she compiled this book that I'm going to read from today. By the age of 19, so she's done all of this at quite an early age, she travels all the way south to Tokyo. By this point, having prepared 13 different tales, which were known as Yuka, and Yuka are basically epics about human heroes and their deeds. She brings all of these to Tokyo, and she works with the Japanese language that she actually met. And they come together and they finally compose this into an actual book, an anthology of tales. And unfortunately, on the very day that this book was finally completed, Chiri suddenly died of heart failure. Oh, same day. The same day. On the very day the book was finished, she died from heart failure. What day? What, what year? Age 19. So that would have been either 1921 or 1922. Wow. The age of so 19. 19. Mm. Oh, wow. Very young. And soon after her death, so the book had been completed on the day of her death, but when it was finally published, the Japanese linguist actually honored her memory and published it unaltered for her. This was the first book, the first actual insight into the Ainu folklore and the languages from the actual like I said, from the actual aspect of an Ainu person. That was a little bit about the author, but if you're ready, I can get stuck into the story. Absolutely. Thanks for the background. That's interesting and really sad, but I'm really looking forward to hearing one of her tales. A very quick brief thing before I start. I mentioned the Yukya, one of the special Ainu words, which is an epic tale about human heroes and their deeds. But if you want to get more specific, all of these tales can actually be classed as Kamui Yukya. Uh, Yuka. And Kamui is basically the name, the name that the Ainu use for gods. So a Kamui Yukya are tales that are actually chanted in first person by the gods. So it's a tale that is told by a god. Hmm. Interestingly enough, all of these tales would have been originally sung. They were actual very long versed songs, but obviously translating them into English, the actual song itself has been lost. So I will just be reading the story. So the Kamui Yuka I chose today in English is known as the song the black fox sang. Traditionally in Ainu, at least, the black fox was seen as like an evil and dreadful and cunning creature, so not the nicest of the Ainu gods. And there are three brothers in this tale. Now, I will attempt to say their names because obviously this being the Ainu language, the pronunciations are a bit different than how you would the standard Japanese. So their names, at least how I'm going to pronounce them, is Oki Kirmui, Shupun Rampka, and Samayonkur. Oki Kirmui is actually reported to have been like the most important of all the Ainu heroes, you'll find him in a lot of different tales, and he is both said to have been wise and brave. Saman Yonkur is said to have been like a shallow, indecisive, and weak person in all of these legends. And his final brother, Shupun Ranka, is, was the oldest of the three. And he was known for his mildness and reticence. And he actually appears in no stories of his own. He's only ever found in stories associated with other people. But yes, on with the tale. I found myself sitting on the rocky headlands of our land, on the rocky headlands of the gods. And so one day I went out to sea, and I saw the sea stretching away before me, both broad and calm. And upon the sea I saw the three brothers, Okikiemui, Shupunramka, and Sama Yonkur. All had sailed out together this day to hunt for whales. But when I saw them in the ocean, my evil heart swelled with malice. And so I ran all over these rocks, 
over the rocky headlands of our land, over the rocky headlands of the gods. I ran with my light feet and my sinuous body, and I barked with a low sound which was like heavy wood splitting. I stared down at the fountainhead of the river, and I called to the storm demon within me. And from that, a violent wind grew forth, a whirling wind from the spring, and blew upon the ocean. Straight away I could see the surface of the sea plunge down, and in the depths of the sea I could see Okimui's boat rising up and rising down in the ocean waves, caught where the coastal waters met the ocean waters. They found themselves in dire peril, in the spaces between the waves, and I watched them spin round and round, mountains of water wrapped around the boat. But the three brothers chanted loudly, and bravely they kept on rowing. The tiny boat was blown around in the waters like a fallen leaf, appearing as if it could capsize at any moment. But those three brave Ainu nobly sent their little boat skipping through the wind, slipping over the tops of the waves. And when I saw them still rowing bravely onwards, my evil heart swelled again with malice. And so I ran with my light feet and my sinuous body, and I barked a low sound like heavy wood splintering. I urged the storm demon onward with all my strength. And as I did so, at last one of the brothers, Samayonkur, with blood running from the palms of his hands and blood running from the backs of his hands, he finally collapsed from exhaustion. And a secret laugh, I could feel it bubbling up inside me. And so once more with all my strength, I ran with my light feet and my sinuous body, barking with the sound of heavy wood splintering. I cheered on the storm demon, and the final two brothers, Oki Kiamui and Chupanranka, they shouted encouragement to each other, and none of them stopped rowing in the ocean. But after a while, Chupanranka, with blood running from the palm of his hands, with blood running from the backs of his hands, also collapsed from exhaustion. And so I laughed again to myself. I jumped up and ran gracefully around with my light feet. I barked again with a sound like hardwood splintering. But Okikimui, still he did not look tired. And with only a thin garment wrapped around his body, still he rode onwards until eventually the oars in his hands snapped at which he sprang over to his half-dead brother, Saman Yonkur, and snatched from him his oar. And still he continued to row onwards, now single-handed. And when I saw this, my heart swelled with malice again, barking with a deep sound like hardwood splintering. I ran around with my light feet and my sinuous body, and again I urged the storm demon on with yet more force. And soon... This replacement all broke from Saman Yonkur. It snapped in half as I watched Oki Kimui rowing. But the final brother still didn't lose hope. He leapt over to Shupanranka and seized up his other brother's oar. And still he tried to sail onwards. But eventually too this oar was broken by the waves of the storm. And so Oki Kimui stood up in the middle of the boat. He was a hero amongst humans, and though I could not scarcely believe it, his eyes, they could find me even in the storm, even though I stood on the rocky headlands of our land, on the rocky headlands of the gods. His eyes stared straight at mine, and his calm face was a colour of anger. And so I watched him on his boat, searching for something inside his bag. And finally he drew something forth, a little wormwood bow, and a little wormwood arrow. But seeing that, all I could do was laugh to myself. What could this so-called human be doing? Trembling in fear of me? What does he hope to achieve with such a feeble arrow, and such a feeble bow? On the rocky headlands of our land I stood. On the rocky headlands of the gods I waited. I ran up and down with light steps, and I ran up and down so gracefully. I barked with a deep sound like heavy wood splintering, and I heaped praise upon praise upon the storm demon. Meanwhile, 
Okikimui's arrow came flying towards me, and it hit me straight in the back of my neck. It went straight through, but whatever happened next I could not tell you, because the world fell dark. And when I finally came to, when I finally regained consciousness, the weather was good upon the surface of the sea. The sea was now wide and calm, and Okikimui's boat had gone. But from the tops of my head all the way down to my feet, I was in agony, as if my skin was burning and shrinking. Never would I have thought that such a little arrow from the human could have caused me such pain. With my limbs twisted in torment, I was on these very rock, over the rocky headlands of our land, over the rocky headlands of the gods. I screamed in pain. I writhed in pain. And by day and by night, I remained there in pain, half living, but also half dead, until finally, somehow, I lost consciousness again. And when I finally came round again, I was sitting between the ears of a great black fox. And after two days, Okikimui finally returned. He came with the appearance of a god, and grinning, he said to me, what a fine sight to see. The black fox god who keeps watch over the rocky headlands, because he has a good heart, a godly heart. He died a good and splendid death. And so saying this, Okikimui, he took my head, and with his vast strength he took my upper jawbone and made out of it a latrine. And out of my lower jawbone he made a latrine for his wife. But my body he left to rot on the earth, and thus I was tortured by day and by night by the horrible stench. I died a pointless death, a horrible death. In the end, I was not content to be a minor god. Because of the evil heart I bore, there was no choice, and so I died a horrible death. Therefore, I must say to all foxes in the ages to come, please learn from my fate. Never harbor inside of you wicked thoughts. So said the fox god. So this story is told from the perspective of technically the villain. Yes. Mm. Is this a common theme in that you've seen with other folk tales, or is this one of the first ones you've really had a chance to study? For Ainu tales like this, I'm not actually too sure. Like I said, for us as well as the listeners, this is our first jump into Ainu folklore. Because I know as well when we started like the Shinto folklore we had questions that we couldn't answer because we hadn't learned too much yet. So I think that's definitely something we'll figure out in the future, perhaps. Like I said, this book of hers does have 13 tales in total, so perhaps the others do have similar themes to it. Mm. So it'd be interesting to see. But I do I do definitely see this story as having like a... It kind of reminds me of like an Aesop's fable. Mm. Like there is a moral to the story to teach people. So I obviously yeah. he's using it in the form of foxes after me, please be aware. But you could also apply it to human behavior. Mm. So it's a cautionary folk tale. Yeah. Learn from my mistakes. Mm. It's very visual and mm. I enjoy. You can tell even if you're just reading it that it should be a song because of the, the re repetition. Yeah. On the headland, on the rocks of the headland, on the rocks of the gods, and things like that. So you can still tell its origins were in song form. It hasn't been lost in the translation, which I like. So what we probably should do soon is see if we can find if this has been recorded. We can actually listen to it because I would, I would love to hear this in the song form to see how they did it. Because yeah, like when, we, when you were saying it and reciting it, like you even had like when you you were reading the repetition parts your voice even kind of flowed along a little bit like a song, just naturally you did it, which I thought was really, it, it made the story more fun to listen to. If you enjoyed it, that's all I was hoping for, really. <laughs> I did. I was, I was like listening and trying to like picturing everything that you were saying. So it was, it was nice for me to sit here and just have a, a story told to me. So thank you. It was, it was, yeah, for the first folk tale from Ainu, I, I really enjoyed that. And I, I like how the perspective was different, that the perspective wasn't from the hero or from a narrator. It was the actual villain. That's 
it is done, but it's not a common is trope the right word? I'm not sure if trope is the right word. I think you can use trope. Yeah, so it's it's it takes the ex- the intended and expected way a tale has been told and just kind of turns it a little bit, which I I do really like having. Like it, you you don't always want to read the same thing in the same way. Sometimes you don't you do want to have that complete change. And like I'm looking forward to the next folk tale because I want to see and compare it to this one. So we have the the perspective from the villain, the villain getting his um come up come up in, in a very descriptive way very peculiar <laughs> so we'll have to see and uh, everyone else will have to all listen together and when we come into another folk tale everyone will need to remind us to and see if they notice things that we we didn't pick up i definitely enjoyed reading it i kind of preferred it to the japanese folk tales a lot of the Japanese fairy tales are they're not stereotypical how we would see them in the West like there's an underdog he gets better it's more like they always pick on the outsiders in a way pushing people to the side still like whereas like in more Western fairy tales like there is an evil thing that they vanquish well you're definitely so touching on some it's a a very in-depth topic that we could get into because I think some of it is like the understanding of like the culture and then where some of the origins of the stories come from like we do have in some of the the folk tales and things there are ties to like, other countries there's ties like a lot of ties to like Chinese culture as well so we have like ancient Chinese culture and in Japanese culture that has its own view so in some ways it feels like we're when we go to study these things more in depth is we're also going to be touching a lot on ancient Chinese culture. So we're, we're not just with the one culture we have like at least two, then you have like, you know, two different um, major religions in Japan. So you have like the cultures from there and not just that, but you also have like from Buddhist, you have Indian um, folk tales that come in as well. Um, I know with true, there's a, there's a rabbit. There's a folk tale about a rabbit that actually has its origins in Indian culture. So I think it becomes complicated, especially because we do come at it from our Western perspective. And I think this is one of the things I think is really important when you're learning like Japanese language is that you need to look into some of the cultural because to understand the language, you have to understand where certain things came from and where where it differs from what you've grown up and what you've experienced to like for us, you know, definitely like the antagonist protagonist, you have the protagonist who is struggling and fighting and then wins at the end. And then sometimes like you don't always have that. And when it changes, it becomes a a really big example um, because we do have that consistent trope of antagonist protagonist. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think we're just really starting to study. That's that's what is also kind of, it's difficult for us because we we have a little bit of knowledge and then just talking with the professor, like he explains a lot of things to me and I, I really, and getting some of his perspective on it because, you know, we come at it, yeah, from, from Western culture and English language and we're not listening to, to it in Japanese either, or in this case, I knew. Um, so we don't, we don't have the comprehension to listen to it in Japanese. And maybe when we listen to it in Japanese, the idea and feeling might change. We just don't know at this point. We're just, we're not there yet. We'll get there. But it's just like when you're a baby, you're just trying to learn new stuff. And you're always learning and you never stop learning. The older I get, the more I realize <laughs> I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you had that insight. I know sometimes when I'm trying to get the words from my head out, I struggle and then you manage to like form a cohesive theory and narrative from it. So thank you for that. But yeah, that is my first I knew tale for now. But well, I'd say let's I'll hand you over to the liter- literature corner, but I also did a story today, so continuation of the literature corner. Let's let's go into the Heather's part of literary corner for today. We have today this week, Thomas, and a lot of things, a lot of things have been going on and we watch the news in Japanese every evening because it's, it's really good practice for me, even though I really, it's, it, the, the news here is difficult to understand. Well, this week, 
we were watching the news and I asked the professor a question because I, I always ask him questions when we're listening to the news, either what's going on or why, why is this? There's a, there's, a, there's a lot about culture I don't understand. And sometimes when we have conversations, instead of giving me the answer, the professor will give me a proverb, sometimes in Japanese and sometimes in English. And you know, it just starts a whole other conversation about many things. And you know, I meant to ask him again what that proverb was he told me, and I I completely forgot and it's a little too late to ask him now but what i took from that was that the conversation reminded me of oh, proverbs like different proverbs such as like what's what's an english proverb you can think of absence makes the heart grow fonder hmm, yeah that's a good proverb i like that so i i thought of some too a penny saved is a penny earned and uh, early to bed early to rise makes a man healthy wealthy and wise I wish that were true. I know. <laughs> Not so much. Not so much. But I think I think these come from, I, I think it's Benjamin Franklin uh, that these uh, come from, which, you know, is, is not Japanese history. So we're going to go circle back to some Japanese proverbs. Like, do you know any Japanese proverbs, Thomas? Well, we have had one mm. before. Episode 21 had a proverb. I am just trying to remember what it was. Ha ha. Something about you are so busy, you would even ask a cat's hand for help. Like you need an extra hand. You're so busy. Mm. But I cannot remember the Japanese. So give me a moment to look up our old notes on the website. Ah, yes. So there we go. So the, uh, the proverb was, Neko no temo karitai. So I don't, rem I don't recall. That was... Oh, many weeks ago, if I said what a proverb was in Japanese, and it's kotozawa. So Japanese proverb is kotozawa. Now, proverbs come from a lot of different places. So just like with, you know, many things, the exact origin of the proverbs isn't always apparent. But in some cases, we might be able to discern where some of these come from, because Japanese proverbs come from like their agricultural culture. They can come from even tea ceremonies are from games like Go and Buddhism too, and Chinese philosophy. There is a lot of proverbs from Chinese philosophy, philosophy, especially like Confucius and Confucianism. There are quite a few from there as well. Back in my first year here, this is a conversation I, rem I remember having with a teacher. We were helping move some furniture for some reason, I don't recall what. And the teacher and I went to go help, but there wasn't a lot of furniture to move. The students were basically doing most of it. So I kind of made a joke about just being in the way. And she she laughed and she agreed. And then she told me a Japanese proverb. And I was like, what does that mean? And she said, I think it's, it's something like, even a dead tree is useful. I was like, oh, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. She said, yeah, like even if you're just standing around and you're trying to help, you're providing like a sense of decoration, a sense of like me wanting to help, even though you're not doing anything, you're still having some function. Like having your presence known that you were trying to help is better than a lack of presence. I believe that's what she was trying to say. That's how I, I interpreted it. And I wrote down the Japanese. I wrote it down because I think we went back into the teacher's room and I said, what was that again? And I wrote it down. I tried to go find that proverb. It's in one of my teaching notebooks. But when I moved, they're not organized yet. That's a future project for several years in the future, maybe. So I couldn't find it, but I did try to do a search online. And I found this one. This might be what she told me because through the mists of time, I cannot <laughs> recall the exact phrasing. But I'm going to read it for you, and I'll see if you can figure out what the proverb says. Kareki mo yama no ni giwai. We heard ki, which, mm. assuming the proverb is similar to the one your teacher said, would be tree in Japanese. I heard yama, which I only know as like mountain. But yeah, the words before tree and after mountain, I'm not sure. I heard mo and I heard no, which I'm assuming are particles in the sentence. Mm. Yep. Um, but kare and giwai 
I'm not too sure what those are in Japanese. Okay. Well, you you definitely got trees and mountain.、Um, the translation is even dead trees give life to a mountain. So very similar meaning in that that presence is useful even though they、hmm. don't necessarily do anything because they're dead. Hmm. I like it. Ki means like dead tree. Yes, dead tree, and then giwai. I feel like I know giwai. What giwai means? Ah, yama ni giwai. So it's ni is not a particle. It's ni giwai. And also, the the kanji itself. Like I went looked up my my much better dictionary and flourish, be bustling, prosperity is some meaning for that. Just just the kanji itself, not for the. The whole entire word, so that would make sense to like be to flourish, to give life.、Mm, that would work. That makes more sense. I like that, and I'm glad that it was something that you found out through an actual Japanese teacher.、Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of nice that she、mm-hmm. told you the proverb. I, I I love that too because it it may if if you can't help sometimes if you just kind of like it, it you feel useless like not being able to help, but even to Provide something helps. Like you don't want to be like the out of his in the way. You want to be like I want to do something. I can't. There's not much I can do. But even just my presence of being here is better than nothing at all. So it it helped because I did feel really terrible, especially that first year, not definitely not knowing as much Japanese and everything was new and trying to just figure out everything. Like just that kind of just little bit, little bit of kindness. Really goes a long way, and I remember it years later. So yeah, a little bit of kindness sure does help, and it also makes you remember more, which is probably why you remember the proverb. So I have a couple more if you want to go over those, or if you want to save those for another day. Actually, I have a whole list because there's so many. And then once I started looking, I was like, "Ooh, I like this one. Ooh, I like this one." So we can save it for another day, or even save it for a bonus episode. How's your feeling? You know what? Let's do it for a bonus episode. We can have a dedication just to proverbs. Okay, excellent.、But、yeah, thank you for the proverb. I definitely enjoyed it. I hope the people listening did too, and I hope they like the Ainu tale. Next week, what are we gonna do next week? The same thing we do every week, Thomas. Self isolate. <laughs> I think. It's about time we did something iconic from Japan, don't you, Heather? Absolutely, I do. So I think we should go and tell the story of Hachiko. Okay, that that that's great. Let's do that. Um. So yeah, next week we're going to do Hachiko. That is, of course, everything from me for today. Heather, do you have anything else to add before we go? Well, it's allergy season, so I hope that everyone who has pollen around them at this time of year.、Uh, Takes care. Drink lots of water, and、uh, thank you so much for listening. And I think that's all I've got for today. <laughs> all right, then, guys. Well, I suppose we will speak to you all next week. Until then, please stay safe. Mata ne. Mina san kyosukete. Mata ne. If you've enjoyed the Japan archives, please consider checking out historyofjapan.co.uk, a database we are making on Japanese history. You can also find the show notes for all our episodes here. If you're on Instagram, you can follow my account over at Nexus underscore Travels. That's N E X U S underscore Travels. We also have a Facebook and Twitter page, which you can find at Japan Archives. If you're interested in little slices of life in Japan, be sure to check out my website over at HeatherOverYonder.com. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, have anything you'd love to hear about, head on over to HistoryOfJapan.co.uk and send us a message. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give us a rating and review over on iTunes. Thank you again for listening, guys. Until next time, bye. Matane.